Through the two years of A-level chemistry, you'll meet quite a range of organic mechanisms and you'll be expected to decide which one applies in a different situation and then show the details um, of what's going on in the mechanism. Now, all of this can seem quite intimidating. There's a lot of detail to remember, um, trying to keep them separate from each other um, in your head, know which one to use, um, making sure you uh, are accurate, um, can seem quite an overwhelming task. And to make life even worse in the exam, um, you'll often be shown a step in a mechanism that you've actually never met before and have no chance of recalling from memory and be asked um, in some way to add detail to it. All of this suggests that rather than trying to simply memorise uh, information, what is needed is a confident um, set of strategies and skills um, that allow you to interpret um, a situation just by looking at it and applying them and, and confidently and accurately um, add in the information needed. So that's what this series of videos seeks to do. Um, and in this first video, we'll specifically look at the business of adding curly arrows to show the movement of electrons, if shown the reactants at the beginning and the products at the end of a step in a reaction. So a key feature of organic mechanisms is these curly arrows like the, the one shown here. Um, and it's important that we understand what they mean or we don't really have a hope of picking up the skills. There's actually two uh, types of arrow we can use in organic mechanisms. Um, the one shown here has a, a whole head um, and that shows the movement of a pair of electrons. So showing two electrons moving. The alternative um, is an arrow with just half a head um, and that shows the movement of just one electron. This video will focus specifically on the uh, arrow with the whole head showing the movement of a pair of electrons. It's by far the most common. Most mechanisms um, involve pairs of electrons moving. Um, the arrow with just half a head, the movement of one electron, um, is specifically for radical mechanisms um, and that will be dealt with in the third video in the series. Rather than trying to talk in some abstract way about curly arrows and what they mean and how to choose them, um, this video instead will look at a whole series of examples. Initially adding in the arrows and explaining in some detail um, how that choice was made and how, how to think about making those choices. Um, and then as the video proceeds, um, just giving you further examples to have a go at yourself uh, with the answer provided for you to check. If you get stuck, uh, find you can't do it, you can obviously return to the earlier, more explained uh, examples. So let's look at this um, first example here. We've got an alcohol um, in, in the yellow at the top. Uh, the R just stands for the rest of the molecule, doesn't matter what that is. It's not taking part, reacting with hydrogen bromide um, to produce the product shown in green at the bottom. It's just one step uh, in a mechanism. Those wouldn't be the final products. Um, but the challenge here is to add the curly arrows needed um, to show what has gone on in terms of electron movement to go from those reactants to those products. It's a normal expectation when doing mechanism steps to add in any partial charges for the parts of the molecule um, taking part in the reaction, so we can put those in uh, as shown. I'm not going to explain how those arise as uh, to do with differences in electronegativity, and that's explored elsewhere in the course. Um, in order to make decisions about curly arrows, we need to compare the reactants and the products um, and look at really two main things. Firstly, bonds. Uh, so covalent bonds either uh, disappearing where there was a covalent bond, so a bond breaking, um, or appearing where there wasn't a bond, so a bond forming. And if we compare these uh, reactants and products here, uh, we can see that we've got a bond between the hydrogen and the bromine in hydrogen bromide in the reactants. Um, by the time we get to the products, that bond has gone. So we're going to break uh, the bond between the H and the Br in hydrogen bromide. And uh, with the organic molecule, um, the oxygen in the alcohol group, uh, initially it was just bonded to one oxygen, uh, to one hydrogen, um, but by the time we get to the product, there is now a second hydrogen bonded to it. So we're also going to have to form a covalent bond, a new covalent bond between the oxygen um, and the hydrogen. Presumably the hydrogen uh, that was part of the hydrogen bromide molecule. Um, there's a second thing we need to look at as well, and that's charge. Uh, ionic charge, uh, not, the, not the partial charges, um, but ionic charge. And so if we look at the reactants, we can see um, there aren't any ionic charges on those molecules. We've got the alcohol and the hydrogen bromide, no ions there. Um, by the time we get to the product, though, we've now got a positive ionic charge on the oxygen in the organic molecule and a negative ionic charge on the bromide ion. So we know what we need to achieve here in terms of bonds and charge changing. 
Uh, let's add the first curly arrow and explain how that would have been chosen. So there it is shown in blue. First of all, look where it's pointing to. It's, it's pointing towards the hydrogen of the hydrogen bromide or into the space between the oxygen of the alcohol and the hydrogen of the hydrogen bromide. So it's bringing a pair of electrons into that space between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Um, and this is our arrow to form a bond. A covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons. So if you want to create a new covalent bond, you have to supply a pair of electrons into the space between the two atoms. So it makes sense um, that you're going to have to have an arrow heading into that space. So there's our sort of first principle. If you spot a bond that has formed, you're going to have to have an arrow uh, heading into the space between the two atoms where the, the new bond will be. Uh, so that brings in the pair of electrons that's required. Of course, that arrow has to therefore start somewhere where there is a pair of electrons um, in order to supply that pair of electrons. And there's really two possibilities there. One is that it could start on a bond. A covalent bond is a pair of electrons. So we can take a pair of electrons from an existing bond, move it to a new location to form a new bond. Of course, that would break uh, the bond where the electrons came from. Um, or we can start the arrow on a lone pair of electrons on an atom. Those are our two possible sources of electrons. So just to recap, to form a bond you're going to have an arrow starting either on an existing bond, taking a pair of electrons from there, or on a lone pair of electrons on an atom, taking a pair of electrons from there, and heading into the space between the two atoms that the new bond will join. So the question in this case is not so much uh, where the arrow is heading, it, it has to head where it's heading in order to form the bond, but why did we start it on the lone pair of the um, electrons on the oxygen? Why not? Why didn't we start it um, somewhere else? How did we know to start it there? Um, and to answer that question, we need to consider charge. If we compare the reactant and the product, we can see that the oxygen in the reactant had no ionic charge on it, but by the time we get to the product, it's got a positive ionic charge. Going from neutral to positive, what does that mean? Well, it means the loss of one electron. So uh, some event has happened that has caused this oxygen to effectively lose um, an electron. Um, and so if you think about what's going on, if that pair of that lone pair of electrons on the oxygen forms a bond between uh, the oxygen and the hydrogen, uh, a bond is a shared pair of electrons. So once that pair of electrons is goes into that bond, um, effectively, one of those electrons will but will still belong to the oxygen, um, but the other one will now belong to the hydrogen that's taking part in that bond. Um, so in moving the lone pair off the oxygen into the bond, the oxygen is effectively losing one electron to the hydrogen, um, and therefore uh, it's becoming one step more positive. So going from neutral one step more positive is a positive charge. So let's add another arrow uh, to complete um, the, the change here and explain where that comes from. Um, you can see this arrow starts on the bond between the hydrogen and the bromine. So why have we done that? Well, um, if it's starting on that bond, it's going to carry the pair of electrons out of that bond. Um, we need to break that bond. We saw that when we compared the reactants and the products. A covalent bond is a shared pair of electrons. Um, so to break a covalent bond, you simply need to move the pair of electrons out of that space between the two atoms. So it makes perfect sense. Um, to break a covalent bond, an arrow has to start on the bond and head away from it, taking those electrons away. The decision then becomes, where do we take those electrons to? The arrow takes them onto the bromine. Uh, why did it do that and not onto the hydrogen? Well, let's unpack that um, so that you can make those decisions for yourself in the future. There's two things to say here, really. Um, if a bond breaks and one atom is more electronegative than the other, um, it's likely that the electrons will go onto that more electronegative atom. Electronegativity is the tendency of an atom to attract bonding electrons towards itself. Um, so with the bromine more electronegative than the hydrogen, that bromine is already pulling those bonding electrons towards itself. So that, that's a general principle you can apply. However, the other thing to do, just like we did before, is to look at charge uh, and compare the charge in the reactants to the product. So if we look at the bromine in the reactants, it, it, it doesn't have an ionic charge, it's neutral. Um, by the time we get to the product, it's a bromide ion with a one minus charge. So to go from neutral to one minus, um, we must gain an electron. Um, and uh, so if we think about what this arrow is showing, the pair of electrons in that hydrogen bromine bond, uh, one of the electrons came from the bromine, the other one came from the hydrogen. So if we move that pair onto the bromine, 
One of the electrons already belonged to it, that's not going to make any difference. But the other one came from the hydrogen, and so it is genuinely gaining an electron. If you gain an electron, you become one step more negative. Um, and so starting neutral and gaining an electron, we go to a one minus ion. So that, the clue here um, that makes us confident we can have the arrow going onto the bromine is by looking at the product and seeing that the bromine has become a Br minus ion. Let's look at our next challenge then. It's actually a continuation of the reaction from the previous uh, slide, um, second step in the, the mechanism. But it really doesn't matter. We don't need to know any context in order to add the curly arrows. We just need to compare the reactants and the products in terms of bonding and charges. If you feel like you've picked up the ideas, the principles involved from the previous example, then maybe pause the video and have a go yourself uh, and then check the answer. I'll go through this one in detail again and then we'll start um, having more and more examples with less and less explanation um, provided. So uh, let's look, let's compare, see what we've got going on here. Um, if we look at the reactants, we've got a single bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Um, and by the time we get to the products, that has broken. The oxygen is no longer bonded to the carbon. The oxygen with its two hydrogens has come off as a water molecule. So we're going to break a bond, the, the CO bond. Um, in the reactants, though, the bromine was on its own. By the time we get to the product, um, that's now bonded to the carbon. So we're also going to have to form a bond, a new CR bond. So there's two things our arrows are going to have to achieve, breaking a bond, forming a bond. And we can also see some charges have changed. Um, in the reactants, the oxygen has positive charge on it. By the time we get to the product, the oxygen now has no charge. It's neutral. Um, and in the reactants, the, the bromine was in the form of a bromide ion with a one minus charge. By the time we get to the product, um, that bromine now has lost its charge as well. It's neutral. So how can we do that with curly arrows? Let's curve, add a curly arrow um, and explain where that comes from. So there it is in red. You'll note that it starts on the bond between the carbon and the oxygen. So that makes sense, hopefully. That's the bond we're trying to break. To break it, we have to move the pair of electrons out of the space between the carbon and the oxygen. So our arrow showing a movement of a pair of electrons starts there, taking those electrons out of that space. Um, it goes on to the oxygen. Why was that choice made? Well, think about what I said before. Two reasons. Number one, the electrons tend to go to the more electronegative atom um, in the bond. If there is a difference, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Um, so it's attracting those bonding electrons. Makes, makes sense that they head in that direction. Um, but secondly, we can look at the charge and we can see that the oxygen appears to have gained an electron um, to go from the plus, the one plus charge to a neutral charge. Um, it must have gained an electron. So it makes sense that pair of electrons moved onto the oxygen. One of them belonged to it anyway. The other one came from the carbon, so to speak. Um, so when the pair of electrons in the CO bond goes onto the oxygen, it is in effect gaining one electron, uh, which allows its charge to go from one plus to neutral. That's not the whole job, though. We also have to deal with the, the bromine now forming a bond with the carbon. So we're going to need an arrow heading into the space between the carbon and the bromine, there it is, and you can see it's heading to the right place. Um, it's starting on the, the bromide ion. Why are we doing that? Um, well, we said before that to form a bond, you need a pair of electrons. The arrow has to start somewhere where there is a pair of electrons. That's either going to be an existing bond or a lone pair of electrons. The bromine has a lone pair of electrons. In fact, bromide ion has four pairs of electron, lone pairs of electrons um, available. Um, so there's, there's a good clue there, there's an obvious source of electrons, um, but how did we know for sure? And again, it's a case of looking at the charge. Um, in the reactants, it's a Br- ion. By the time we get to the product, it doesn't have a charge. So we've obviously lost one electron um, in going from the reactants to the products on the bromine. So if we use the lone pair of electrons on the bromine to make a shared pair with the carbon, um, in that share, one of the electrons uh, still belongs to the bromine, um, but the other one... Um, we can say is sort of taken possession of by the the carbon and so the bromine then has affected the bromide ion has effectively lost one electron taking its charge from one minus down to neutral so a third example um, and i'd encourage you to pause the video and use the ideas introduced so far to sketch in some curly arrows and then see if you're right so the partial charges always a good idea to add them the curly arrows that you need are these two shown here. Uh, so let's just quickly explore where, where those came from. Um, we've got one uh, heading 
into the space between the oxygen um, of the left-hand reactant and the carbon of the right-hand reactant. And so that's going to be an arrow forming a bond, and that makes sense. We can see in the product that we do have a new bond um, from the oxygen um, to the, the carbon of the right-hand reactant. Um, and it's starting on the lone pair of the oxygen, and that makes sense as well, because we can see that the oxygen went from a one minus charge um, in the reactant to neutral uh, in the product. And so that says it's effectively lost an electron. So we'd expect an arrow to be carrying um, an electron away from it. Um, the other arrow uh, starts on the CBR bond. Um, so that's going to be breaking that bond. And that makes sense if we look at the product the bromine is no longer bonded to the carbon um, and the arrow goes onto the bromine. Um, it makes sense in terms of electronegativity. The bromine is more electronegative than the carbon, so it's attracting those electrons anyway. Um, but we can see in the product that the bromine has effectively gained a new electron um, to make it a Br- ion. So it makes sense that there's the arrow um, heading onto the bromine. So the remaining slides in each case will show you a set of reactants and products for a reaction step. And the challenge for you will be to pause the video, um, inspect, see what you see in the way of bonds forming, bonds breaking, charges changing, and add in the curly arrows uh, that would show the electron movements to cause what you have observed. You can then uh, check with the provided solution. If you got it right, great, move on to the next one. If you got it wrong, spend a bit of time uh, looking at the arrows of the correct solution, seeing how they perfectly account for the changes uh, that happen and spotting where you went wrong. Um, don't forget, it's always good to add any relevant partial charges as well. So here's your first example. Pause the video um, and see what you can do with curly arrows. And a solution would be as follows. So here's your next challenge. Pause the video and have a go. And a solution would have the following partial charges and curly arrows. Here's your next challenge. Don't worry that it might look a little bit unfamiliar. Um, carry out the normal inspection um, and pause video, add in curly arrows that you think will provide the changes seen. And we'll have these partial charges and these curly arrows will account for the changes. Another challenge for you, pause the video, try and add the curly arrows. And we've got these relevant partial charges and these curly arrows to bring about the changes. Next challenge, pause the video and have a go. And we've got partial charges as shown and the curly arrows as shown here. Next challenge for you, pause the video and have a go. partial charges and curly arrows. Another example for you. Hopefully this is starting to make some sense uh, by now. Um, pause the video, add in partial charges and curly arrows as relevant. So some partial charges and a couple of curly arrows. Just to make life a bit more exciting, um, here's actually two steps in a reaction mechanism. Uh, so plenty of opportunity for adding partial charges uh, and curly arrows to account for all the changes that you see as you move from the very uh, initial reactants at the top through the intermediates in the middle to the final products at the bottom. Pause the video and have a go. So uh, the answers, um, partial charges, in the reactants and relevant curly arrows to get to those intermediates and then uh, further curly arrows uh, to get from the intermediates to the final products. Taking things on upper level, here's another two-step reaction but this time we're not showing you uh, the organic intermediate uh, in the middle. So what you need to do is look at the reactants at the top 
compare them to the final products at the bottom, um, see what's happened in terms of uh, bonds breaking, bonds forming, etc. Um, and then think what might happen initially um, to form an intermediate that could react with the H3O plus shown in green to carry on to those products at the bottom. So pause the video, scratch your head, figure out some curly arrows and partial charges. Answer coming in a moment. So we can have partial charges on the reactants as shown and curly arrows. That'll give us the following intermediate and then further curly arrows to take us to the products. For your final challenge, a three-step mechanism, um, but to help you on your way, um, there's a curly arrow already added for the first step so that you can predict that initial intermediate. So pause the video um, and see if you can figure out a series of intermediates and further curly arrows um, to get us round to that final product in green at the bottom. So we've got an initial bond forming from the oxygen uh, to the hydrogen to give that H2O plus group at the top. How do we get from there down to that final product? Well, uh, we've obviously got to lose that H2O plus group and so it makes sense that breaks the CO bond with the electrons going onto the uh, positive oxygen that will produce a water as shown um, and we'll now have a positive charge uh, on the carbon. We've also got to lose the hydrogen on the carbon on the right um, so a final rearrangement that would solve all of our problems would be that the CH bond pair of electrons move to form that second bond of the CC double bond in the product.